Hi Anand, welcome back to our second stream of comparing the poems and making links between them. Um, your title for today is Finding Links, the Presentation of Conflict. So what, what that's the category that we're going to have a look at today. We're going to make links between the poems, thinking about how the writers present conflict. So what are they saying about war? Um, what aspects of war are they asking us to focus on? So, as I said, this bit is going to be a little bit more detailed and thorough because um, we're zooming in all the time to try and be more sort of detailed in our analysis and our thoughts. So, um, every time that we compare, we always need to compare three different things. The first one is the writer's meaning. So, what are they actually saying about conflict? What, what do they think? What's their attitude? What feelings are they generating? We also need to compare the language and structure, so the writer's choices, what choices have they made and how have they chosen to, chosen to convey their ideas and their meanings. And then finally, we need to compare the context. Now, I always see the context as being the why. So why has one writer chosen to present war in this way and another writer has chosen to present war in that way? Well, it's probably something you can quite easily link to the context when it was written, what was going on at the time, um, you know, what the writer's personal feelings towards the war were. Um, so that's how you can thread your context knowledge into your comparison. You always think about it being, or you can always think about it being the why. Okay, so today we're going to ask ourselves three questions within this category of the presentation of conflict. So we're going to ask ourselves what part or aspect of conflict is presented by each poet, and that's going to be comparing meanings. We're going to ask ourselves what similar different, similar and different choices the poets have made, and that's going to be our comparing of writers' choices. And then finally, we're going to ask ourselves how has the context of each poem shaped these choices and this meaning? Um, and that, of course, is number three, context, the why. Okay, so um, hopefully you've got down that title um, and we will get started. So the lesson will be in three parts and it's very much focused on moving through these three questions. Okay, so first one, we're going to look at aspects of conflict. So I'm going to ask you to start off with this one, especially because um, last lesson, um, or the, in my previous stream, we spent a lot of time talking through um, what different ideas about war each poet was creating, um, whose perspective we saw it from, what they thought about the impact of war. So I'm hoping that you can have a good go at this now. Now, just to stress, what I'm going to ask you to do is um, create five uh, sort of five little like mind maps across your page or, or word clouds because what you're going to do is you're going to draw arrows linking these together in a minute so make sure you've got space and you've spread them out across your page um, and underneath each poem what I would like you to do is just summarize for me what aspect or what part of conflict is presented by each poet so which what what are they saying about war? What what are they? How are they presenting war? Um, so you just to just to reiterate, make sure they're nice and spaced out across your page. Maybe take a whole page and just do five bubbles, five little clouds with your with your answers in for each poet. Okay, right. Pause the video and have a go at that now, please. I don't know why the man hasn't got a question mark. I'm sorry. Okay, so. Um, for example, uh, these are just potential answers. Obviously, if you've got something similar, that's fine. Um, if anyone's got exactly what I've written word for word, then I'm very, very, very worried that you've read my mind and that's worrying. Um, so anything similar to this is absolutely fine. So for the soldier, I would expect you to say something like that the, the Brooke is focused on the glory of dying for your country. Um, so give that a tick if that's what you've got or add, add to it if you've not. For Dulce, I'd expect you to say something about how he the focuses on the horrors and reality of war. You might be even more specific and talk about, you know, the impact of a gas attack and the aftermath of that. For Mammoth, I'd expect you to talk about the wastefulness of war um, and the long term effects on the land. You might have also talked about how war can unite the soldiers, and that's great as well. For a wife in London, the impact of war on those back home, you might have been more precise and talked about a wife. Um, you might have been more precise and talked about the loss of a husband and how, you know, the impact of death caused by war. And finally, for the manhunt, without its question mark, randomly, um, again, long term effects of war and the impact on those back home. Again, a wife in this case. 
So what you should be starting to see already is that there are obvious similarities and differences here um, that we can compare and make links between um, as part of our comparison of meanings in the poems. So that is what I would like you to do now. Um, what I'd like you to do is draw arrows between um, the similarities and the differences. And I don't want you to annotate at all. I'd like you to create a little key um, so I have done my similarities in red and I've drawn red arrows between the two po the poems that have similarities and I have done my differences in purple and I've done purple arrows between the poems that are obviously different. So can you do the same now? Pause the video, have a go and um, get yourself a key, uh, two colours um, or different types of line if you'd prefer if you've not got two colours um, and make links between the similarities and differences. Okay, once you've done that, unpause the video. Okay, so my first similarity is Away from London and the Manhunt, where we've obviously got um, the impact of war on those back home. And obviously in more detail there, we've got the idea of the impact on wives um, and sort of dealing with the aftermath of war. Okay, so that's a similarity. We've also got a similarity between Mammoth's Wood and the Manhunt because they're both focused on the long-term effects of war and the you know the the aftermath of it in the manhunt it's going to take so long for the wife to find her husband again um metaphorically speaking and in mammoth's wood it's going obviously the the land and the earth is going to take a long time to recover from from the devastation of the war as is that little village in wales um which lost a lot of men as because because of the battle of mammoth's wood so that's a clear similarity. So I've got a red arrow. And also I've got similarity between Dulce and Mammoths um, because I feel like both of them do expose the wastefulness of war. Um, you know, obviously Dulce, we see the man dying from the gas attack, the horrible death that he goes through as a result. We see men walking, um, bloodshed and all the rest of it. So there's a sense of waste um, and that... Um, you know, blind baggers and hags, and that idea that the the men are old before their time, and that's emphasised in Mammoth's Wood, isn't it, with the youthfulness um, of the men and and how young and fragile they were. Okay, differences then. Um, as I said last lesson, to me the most obviously contrasting poems are the Soldier and Dulce. We've got it's brilliant to die for your country versus it's horrific to die for your country. It's a waste of life. It's an old lie. Not true. Okay, and to me, I think there are clear differences between the soldier and every other poem. Um, you know, for every other poem, if we've got this one poem, haven't we, that's completely traditional um, and has this, you know, celebratory tone, patriotic, patriotic tone, and the other four are, are very much focused on the opposite experience of a very negative experience. Okay, so hopefully you have drawn similar links. Um, and we're going to build up on this. So next time we forge links in this lesson, I'm going to ask you to actually do a bit of annotating and explain to me why they're similar or why they're different. OK, let's move on then. So we've just looked at question one, which part or aspect of culture is presented by each poet? We're now going to have a look at what similar or different choices the poets have made. Now, to answer this question, you need to look far more closely at the poems and the kind of language choices and the structural choices that the writers have made, the narr narrative choices the writers have made, who's speaking to you. Uh, basically, anything that the writer's chosen to do, which has led to the to the production of this poem. And obviously, um, I don't know when the last time you wrote a poem was, hopefully it wasn't too long ago. Um, you, know, you have to think everything through, don't you? You're making choices all the time. And this is just about you looking for similarities and differences in the choices the poets have made. And you can't really do that without really looking at the poet, poems. Now, to help you out today, what I have done is I have picked out one quotation from each poem. OK, now, obviously, normally you'd only be comparing two poems and you would be expected to compare um, quotations from across both poems and make links between the language choices and structural choices used. Um, however, today is just about form practicing that, practicing the not the idea. Excuse me. Excuse me. Practicing the idea of forging links between language. OK, so. All of these quotations are part of 
um, our original category, which is we're looking at the each poem's presentation of conflict. So I think these quotations each sort of um, suggest something about the poem's presentation of conflict. They're saying something about conflict here. So what I'd like you to do is, um, same as we did with the um, poem titles, can you now uh, write these quotations across your page, nice and spread out so that you can draw lines between them? But bear in mind that eventually with this one, you're also going to label your arrows between your between your clouds or your boxes. So make sure you've got lots of space between each, each one. OK, so pause now and spread those quotations out across your page. OK. Um, now you've drawn them out, what I'd like you to do now is link the quotation to the poem that it's from. All right, so some of you might be able to do this straight away off the top of your head. Uh, some of you might need to go back through your notes and find which poem the quotation is from. And can you just write down the poem either underneath the quotation or on top of the quotation or near the quotation? Um, and if you pause now while you do that, and then I'll, I'll go through the answers. Okay. So they're all up there. Make sure you've got them right. So tick them off um, if you have. If you haven't got it right, um, if you just or if you left it blank, make sure you filled in the correct answer. OK, right. So as I said, what I'd now like you to do is a bit of annotation and, and linking again. So we're building up this time. I want you to do a little bit more now. So we've got the five quotes. They should be nicely spread out across your page. What I'd like you to do is draw a line between two of the quotes and I want you to actually explain this time in your own words why this language choice is similar or different okay so I'm asking you to start thinking about doing a bit of analysis here now I've got an example for you and then and we'll do that together now and then I'd like you to pause the video and have a go at doing two to three links of your own so this is my link and I've, I've done it in purple again because this is a difference so white eyes writhing in his face from Dulce to me is very different to in heart at peace under an English heaven from the soldier. That last, the soldier is so calm and peaceful language, isn't it? It creates this really beautiful idealistic image, whereas white eyes writhing in his face is horrible. <laughs> yeah, it, it suggests pain. It just utter, utter like misery that you can't escape, um, you know, that he's trying to escape this pain and he can't. Um, so the impact of both of those lines are completely contrasting. So in terms of how we phrase it, try to use the phrase the writer chooses just just for this activity. And I think it will really help you to start thinking about the fact that you should be analysing your writer's choices and picking them apart. So Owen chooses this image to suggest immense pain, whereas Brooke, oh, sorry, should say chooses, not choices, whereas Brooke, <laughs> Brooke chooses. No. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I can't read my own sentence. Whereas Brooke's choices suggest death will be peaceful and calm. OK, so that's just a summary of what I've just said um, in a little bit more detail. Um, so when you're doing your links, make sure you clearly make sure it's obvious if it's a similarity or a difference. And then try to use a comparative connective like whereas, for example, um, and then just pin down what choice each writer's made and, and how they create different meanings. OK, have a go. It doesn't matter if, if you can't do all of them. Just try to do that for two to three other links. So you can choose which ones you do. Um, and hopefully you can see that there's some that are very similar and some that are quite, quite different. OK, pause now and have a go. OK, I'm just going to take you through um, two examples and Obviously, you could have a lot more. You might have a lot more. You might have chosen different ones. That's absolutely fine. Uh, again, if you want specific feedback, just um, get in touch with the teacher or, or let me know. Um, so one example I've got for you is um, this link between the broken bird's egg and the porcelain collarbone. So both those choices there really highlight how fragile the soldiers are, don't they? So bird's eggs uh, are so easily, easily broken. And also the idea of innocence, isn't it? And again, the porcelain collarbone. Remember, porcelain is those really fragile, beautiful plates and, and, and um, teapots and things you can get that are so easily broken. Um, so really, both writers have chosen a very similar um, approach there, haven't they? They've both chosen to use very fragile objects 
to represent how fragile these soldiers are in the war. Um, so it's quite interesting that they've both chosen to use that. That's those similar images, I think. Um, so that's a good one. That's a really interesting one. Uh, another one, uh, we've got a difference now. Um, the ha hand whom the worm now knows, um, which I think is one of the most interesting lines in Away From London. It's, it's a horrible line. It's really blunt and crude. And I don't think I've ever read a description to describe a soldier decaying in the ground <laughs> that's as, as horrible as this one, really. Um, but there's such a perfect contrast there, isn't there? So Hardy's chose to create this really blunt image of a soldier decaying in the ground, whereas Brooks chosen to portray this idealistic image, as any of, of peace in heaven. Um, you know, this image of this man asleep underneath in the ground under an English heaven couldn't be any more different to this idea of a man under the ground being eaten by worms. Yeah, it's pretty crude. OK, um, so there's a key difference in the writer's choices there. There's there's plenty of other ones you could have looked at, um, but they were just, to me, the ones that really stood out. Um, and hopefully that gives you an idea of the kind of links you can be making between um, the quotations in different poems. OK, as I said, the better, the, the, this is so much easier if you know these poems really well because you'll be able to think off, off the top of your head, oh, that quote links really nicely to that quote, because you know them in your head. Obviously, if you don't know them, then you're going to have to turn into a bit of a detective, scouring over both poems, looking for quotations that link together. Um, so with the poetry, the more you put into it, the more you get out, really. Um, and if you think about song lyrics, ha song lyrics stick in our head, don't they? And they just last forever. I can still remember song lyrics from... from songs that were out in year six and seven <laughs> spice girls um but they've never left me because we just we we just have this great memory and we can retain these lyrics it's the same with the poems it really is so the more you read them and revisit them the more they'll stick in your head um and the easier you'll find all of all of the analysis and comparison okay little little segue there right let's get back to it so we've now looked already at questions one and two We've looked at the similar and different choices the poets have made. Now, I could have done that for another hour, but I just wanted to give you a taster of it. OK, so the last thing we're going to do to finish off is we're going to have a look at question three, how the context of each poem has shaped these choices and these meanings that that, that each poem has in them. OK, so for this, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a different activity for you. So you're fed up with doing tables and clouds and... Uh, what else we do? And the Venn diagram we did last last, last lesson. Um, so I'm going with a traditional fill in the gaps. OK, so in terms of linking context, the why this is your subheading for this section, please, in your book. I have written for you the four sentences and I have summarised for you um, what what the poet has 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 done, something the poet's done, something the poet's chosen. Um, or something the poem is poet is saying about war. And then what I want you to do is finish off the second sentence by thinking about what do you know about the context of this poem and how can that be used to explain this choice? Now, notice I've said this is possibly because because we need to be keeping a nice open speculative tone and we need to be kind of not assuming um, things about the writer. We need to be suggesting things about the writer and the choices they've made and why they've made them. So Brooke has presented war far more positively than the rest of the poets. So you're going to write that down and then I want you to really stop and think, what do you know about when Brooke wrote this poem and how? what do you know that could be a reason for why he was more positive than the rest of the poets? Now, hopefully that is something that you it's coming to your brain straight away. If it's not, then you need to go back through your notes on the soldier and have a think about what do you know about your, the context of the time, what was happening, what were people feeling, and how could that have led him to write a more positive war poem? Okay, and then do the same for the remaining three sentences. So pause now, have a go, and then I'll go through the answers with you. Okay, so different colour pen if you can, please. Um, so hopefully you got that because he was writing the poem at the start of World War One. Um, sorry, that shouldn't really be a capital H, nor should it have four dots for the ellipsis. It's all going wrong. Um, so, he, sorry, he wrote the poem at the start of World War I when everyone was feeling far more patriotic and positive about the war. So that is a really good way you can link the context to this 
to this comparison point. He's he's of course he's far more positive than everybody else because he was writing at a time when everybody was far more positive about the war. Okay. In number two, Owen has presented war using the most blunt, horrifying language. This is possibly because he'd witnessed firsthand the horrors of war and the new weapons of World War One, for example, the gas. Okay, and he's the only writer who who did that, wasn't he? So you've got again a very clear link between the context of the poem and why Owen has used this really blunt, horrifying language in comparison to the other poets. Number three, Armitage and Hardy have both focused on the after effects of war. So that's the similarity between them. And this is possibly because neither poets had first hand experience of war and they wanted to highlight the long term damage. So what the reason why these poets are quite united in what they focused on is a neither of them went to war. So it would have been very hard for them to write a poem like Wilfred Owen did. And why would you try to? Why would you try to imitate that style when you're never going to write as good as Owen? Um, but also they were united in their purpose. They both wanted to emphasise something to their readers and it was something similar. So that's why they've got a lot of similarities between the two poems. Remember, these are the two poems that we said were the most had the most in common. And finally, unlike the other poets, she is both celebrates and mourns the loss of the soldiers at Mammoth's Wood. This is possibly because many of the men lost their lives. Who lo I've met, sorry, many of the men who lost ah, <laughs> many of the men lost were from a Welsh village, and she has wanted to honour his countrymen. Uh, that should really say perhaps. So perhaps she has wanted to honour his countrymen, but also highlight what a big loss they were, obviously, to the community. Um, and that horrible tragic line of where they were told to walk not run towards the nest in machine guns um you know the tragedy of the loss and how just pointless it was in many for many who lost their lives in the song okay of which mammoth's wood was one battle of right okay so um that concludes the context links and um, hopefully that's okay just to summarize what we've done there is we've made links between our context knowledge and our comparisons we're explaining why the poets are similar and different sorry the poems are similar or different um, and that is one of the elements of that you need to be thinking about next year building that into your essays and it's probably the trickiest part really um, because you don't ever you don't ever have to do this in another essay you do need to link to context in other essays but you don't ever have to compare context in any other essay um so that's why it's a bit tricky we don't do it very often so we thought we'd better do it now okay and that ends the lesson so um just to conclude um i hope that you have a really restful and happy summer holidays as much as you can um, and we are so looking forward to seeing you again in september um fingers crossed everything goes well um and yet take care year nine and thank you for all the hard work you've done on these poems it will pay off i promise you in two years time um, and remember we will be revisiting this in september um, but do your best um, if you have fallen a bit behind to catch up on those five poems and give yourself a solid knowledge if anyone fancies putting the poems to some kind of rap so we can all remember it easier then i would very much welcome your submissions um because that would be amazing Anyway, take care, you nine, and I will see you very soon. Bye.